uh, we're going to be investigating uh, different kinds of experimentation and the limits of it uh, with three fabulous speakers. John Ioannidis is a professor of medicine, of health research, and of biomedical data science at Stanford University. And his 2005 paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, brackets except this one, uh, is the most downloaded paper of all time in the public library of science. Claudia de Ram uh, is an award-winning professor of theoretical physics at Imperial College London. And Claudia is recognized for her revitalization of and research into massive gravity theory. And Harry Collins is one of the leading sociologists of science in the world and teaches at the School of Social Sciences, Cardiff University. Most recently, he's been a prominent voice on the role of experts in society, the importance of science in democracies, and the dangers of artificial intelligence. So we're going to kick off, uh, as we do uh, uh, at the festival, with uh, three uh, brief pitches. So you're going to give uh, three minutes to each of our speakers to answer uh, a simple question. Has human bias broken the scientific model? And we're going to uh, allow Harry to go first. Harry, what's your three-minute take? Well, my answer is, is no. No. Um, uh, for the simple reason that the scientific model uh, never really held up. I think there is a, a sort of subset of people who think that science is uh, an automatic procedure. It's something you can do by formula. And uh, when utopia comes, science can be, will be able to be done by computers, working away automatically, just following what Karl Popper called the logic of scientific discovery. But actually, science has never been like that. Scientists have always disagreed with each other. Scientists have always looked at the same data and come up with, in, with in different results. And so that any formula uh, of that sort just doesn't hold up. And this even applies to the replicability of experiments. I mean, people think that you can test a theory by replicating it, but that's only the case when nobody's disputing it very strongly. If people are disputing it very strongly and somebody says, well, I tried your experiment and it didn't work, they'll say, well, that's because you didn't do the experiment properly. And if you go back to your time or to your time at school, you will know that most of the experiments you did never worked in the first place anyway, until the teacher told you exactly how to do it. And scientists on the frontier are in the same sort of position, really, so that there never was an experimental replication as a sure way to find out what's true or not. It's still sensible to go for replications, but it doesn't produce an automatic answer. Very good. Well, that's admirably brief, and thank you. Claudia, your three minutes. Has human bias broken the scientific model? I think we're, we're humans, so of course we have biases, and that has affected uh, the way we do science. It affects the way we interact with our environment, and it affects the way we relate to our observations and make conclusions. But I think the way biases are taken into account in bioscientific models can be very viable, and so it's not a scientific model as a whole. Um, maybe, let me just give you an example, and for that let me talk about p-value. Uh, which is sometimes used as an indicator to determining how likely a result is just a re uh, uh, an observation is just the result of a statistical fluke. So just a random noise, if you were. Um, in some fields, uh, there's a lot of publications which are accepted in journals um, for which they have a p-value of 0 0.05. That means that there's one in 20 chances that this result is just noise. There's absolutely no scientific content in that result. That's just the way it is. Um, would you jump on a plane if you knew that it had one in 20 chances of falling down? That's up to you to decide. Um, if you want to compare this with other fields, let me just talk about the discovery of the Higgs uh, particle, for instance. That's an experiment that took over 49 years uh, to get accomplished. It involved thousands of scientists throughout the planet working together, disagreeing sometimes and ultimately agreeing, but they had blind analysis throughout. They had two independent detectors working in parallel and the announcement was only ever made when it reached a p-value of point, let me see, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3. So that corresponds to one chance in 3.5 millions that it was just statistical noise. 
it's completely different. That's about the same probability as going on a plane and the plane falling down. So when you jump on a plane, are you biased towards thinking that it's safe? Yes, you are. I am biased and I still go on it. Does it mean that the whole machinery is broken and I should never do that again? That's up to you to decide. I mean, this is all subjective. Thank you for that. And John, uh, your, your initial foray uh, into the territory, uh, has human bias broken the scientific model? I, I think that the science is uh, the best thing that has happened to humans. Uh, this sounds like uh, good news, but at the same time, it means that science is human. And uh, we humans, uh, we are agents of uh, errors, mistakes, biases, fallacies. Uh, you know, we can very easily get it wrong. Uh, we can have strong beliefs. We can have uh, strong interpretations. We can have strong priors, some of them justified, others not justified. And this means that we have a, a constant struggle between some objective uh, data and results uh, that may also be error-prone and uh, uh, they have their own noise and, uh, and biases of all sorts, and also uh, our interpretation and our filtering in our selective reporting and selective cherry picking of, uh, of that universe of accumulated evidence and, and information. This has been the same since the very beginning of, of science. Uh, you know, it's, it's a constant struggle. At any point in time, if you just take uh, the uh, hundreds, thousands, millions, tens of millions of, uh, of papers that are floating around, uh, some of them uh, will have far more reliable information uh, compared to others, and some of them may even be useful. Very few of them actually will be useful, but uh, um, it's going to be a, a continuum of uh, information that is very reliable all the way to completely unreliable, information that is useful all the way to being completely useless or even harmful. So the, the question is uh, not to lament about the lack of perfection or, or the fact that we have humanity, our, our human nature deal with, uh, with these problems, but just to try to do our best. And I, I think that we have ways that we can optimize the efficiency, we can optimize the chances that uh, what we'll, we'll get will be more reliable and eventually also more useful in some Great. cases. And we're gonna, we'll come back to those practical, uh, maybe even useful uh, uh, tips a little later. I mean, Harry, can I look back to you on, on, on where we, we began this little journey? Can you imagine a, a truly objective science? Is that even something which it's worth trying to bring to mind? Or, or is, it, 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 is the enterprise fatally flawed from the outset? Well, I mean, I can imagine it. I mean, but I can imagine it being described by a science fiction writer. Um, and it would, you know. What would that world? What would that world be like? I, I, I should imagine. I, I can imagine Isaac Asimov writing this um, story about it. You know, and it would, the science would be done by computers. And right. So, would there be humans in the story? I guess is the key question, right? Well, would there be humans in the story? Well, yeah, I can imagine it because I think there are subdomains within science where you can uh, approximate to the model. Um, Claudia has, has been kind of intimating that high energy physics might be one of those subdomains, but I don't think she's right because, uh, the, I mean, it, it, high energy physics is very interesting because high energy physics has changed its standards for what counts as a discovery. In the 1960s, it was three standard deviations. And as she said, nowadays it's five standard deviations. And uh, I'll tell you how, Heine, if I can read out a quote, how it was that high energy physics got from one place to another. This is from Jay Marks, who was the uh, one time the director of the LIGO, the LIGO, uh, the, which discovered gravitational waves. He says, years ago, difficult experiments were done to study the weak interaction. Some of those experiments were published with high significance, three sigma and greater. Later turned out to be wrong. While experiments had a five sigma effect, mostly turned out to be right. The result was a common wisdom or mythology that one should not be confident in a result unless it was a five sigma effect. And I could continue like that. So physics has done a kind of big, huge, long experiment on what level of significance you need if that's what you're relying on, level of significance. 
and physics is discovered, you need at least five. But of course, physics still goes wrong because there are some five sigma results that turn out not to be right, such as the discovery of cosmic gravitational radiation, which happened just before the real gravi gravitational radiation. So, I mean, Claudia, you know, the, the good bit about hominem, you're, you're standing here for physics uh, and Harry is trying to persuade us that while you might claim uh, to believe that it's a truly objective science, uh, he's, he's chipping away at that. Are you prepared to, to return to your defense of it? Do you think that the, the p-value arguments uh, do still make high energy physics as it's conducted today uh, a good candidate for a truly objective science? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.